eighth graders! It's great to see you. I hope that you're doing well and staying safe during this time. I'm going to be reading to you from a book about one of our pop artists, Roy Lichtenstein. So we talked about him a lot last week and I found this book that I wanted to read to you about him that also ties into the learning we're doing this week. So this book is really cool. It kind of looks into his studio. So I'm just going to read you a quick excerpt from the beginning and then I'm going to move into um, the rest of the book and I'll kind of just talk you through it. Roy Lichtenstein's studio is an artist's wonderland. As you enter, there are armies of easels and fat pots of bright colored paints. The ceilings are more than 20 feet high. The walls look as if they are striped. Long wooden beans hold the many oversized paintings he's doing at any given time. The white planked floors are splattered with paint, splotches of blue and yellow, some pink and white here, red over, way over there. When Roy walks into the studio each morning, he is very enthusiastic about what he's going to do that day. He is a trim man of medium height who stands very straight. Most days he wears a t-shirt, blue jeans, and sneakers. On his wrist is a pink-faced watch with a bright green band. Often as he talks, he runs his hand through his hair to brush it off his forehead. The summer studio is in Southampton, New York, on the Atlantic Ocean Beach. It is a squarish building painted white inside and out. There isn't very many windows in the walls because Roy needs all the space to hang his many large sized paintings. There are skylights through the roof. Even if the electricity is out because of a storm or hur hurricane, that sometimes happens, the studio is washed evenly in light. Roy Lichtenstein burst into the art world in 1961 with a style that had never been used by serious painters. He took printing techniques from newspapers, especially comic strips. Because his oil paintings had flat primary colors, Bendet dots and diagonal lines instead of brush strokes. The pictures seem cold. So right here we have a picture of Bendet dot, ben dots, um, right here at the top in red, and then underneath we have diagonal lines drawn. So those are two styles that he would use a lot inside his work. He even put cartoon characters into his drawings. People were shocked. Some observers couldn't tell whether or not he was just making an elaborate joke. At first, art critics said Roy Lichtenstein's work would be forgotten right away. They insisted that the public and art collectors would ignore Roy's paintings or think they were silly. Instead, people enjoyed what they saw. The critics soon changed their minds. Now Roy Lichtenstein is one of the most famous artists of our century. Critics and big companies around the world ask or commission Roy to create important paintings and sculptures for them. In the lobby of a New York City office building, an enormous several stories tall painting, mural with a blue brushstroke, is an excellent example of how Roy's art has become part of many people's everyday lives. His work is found in permanent collections at every museum in the world that has modern art. And recently, the entire rotunda of the Guggenheim Museum in New York was given over to a major retrospective of his art. The exhibits Exhibition of his drawings, paintings, and sculptures from all stages of Roy's art travel to Los Angeles, Montreal, and Europe. But how does a painter like Roy go about creating his art? Few of us will ever have a chance to watch firsthand how the artworks we see in a museum grow from an idea to a sketch to a full painting. In a surprisingly exciting process, by it is a surprisingly exciting process. By visiting Roy Lichtenstein in his studio, we can see that his creativity requires hard work. Here is an inside look at the artist's daily life. So right here we've got a picture of Roy and his studio looking at a blank canvas. And over here it talks about how he likes to listen to classical music while he makes his art. Um, he likes to get on a tall ladder and he likes to work really big. That's why he needs the ladder. So he uses the ladder so that he can reach the top of his giant pictures. Um, so what he writes about here is that he's a perfectionist with his lines, which is something that stands out a lot when you look at his work. Everything is very mathematically correct and precise. The distance between every one of his dots is this equal and the same. Um, and he does that by using tape. So he tapes off different areas with masking tape or with something we call painter's tape, which is a very, um, light tape that won't rip your canvas 
and that's how he gets his lines to be precise and he uses a ruler to make sure everything is exactly the same width apart so you can see him right here he's using a straight piece of wood to get precision and over here he is working with a ruler to create precision and then again we see him in this big picture here using a ruler Um, the next thing he says is that he starts by doing a sloppy drawing and then erasing away and creating his final drawing on top. I think most artists work that same way too. You always want to start drawing lightly in pencil. As I like to say, draw light until you get it right. Um, and then after that is when he starts going in with his black paintbrush and making these thick black lines. So he does the black lines before he does the color or the dots. Here he is mixing his paint. He uses oil paint, which it's very hard to see that this is oil paint. I would expect that this, if I didn't know anything about Roy Lichtenstein, I would expect his art is created on a computer or with acrylic paint if it was paint. However, he uses oil paint. Oil paint tends to kind of create a thicker, more abstract texture, which is why people are surprised that that's the medium he uses. Um, so you can see him over here. Um, he sometimes uses a technique where he puts tape that he paints over and then he rips the tape away to show the paint that's underneath. So that's what's happening in this picture here. Um, it talks a little bit about his assistant who works with him. Um, he has taken on a young artist to help him create his art. And we can see him finishing up the piece right here. So last week we kind of looked more at his um, celebrity and comic book type art. But he has a lot of really interesting interior design art. And he has some sculptures too. There's some different pictures of his different kinds of art here. This is kind of what we were looking at last week. Over here we've got the interior art. So how cool is that? He's down there painting and it really looks like he's inside the room and that's pretty neat. Here's another one of his sculptures. Oh, and so this one, this one applies to our work this week since we're drawing food. It's a baked potato. And there's one more picture that I just wanted to show you before we close up this book. There's him working in the studio. And over here, these are some of his most well-known works. So maybe I'll post a picture of that so you can look a little closer. Now, I did want to show you one more thing before I ended the video. This is my Where's Wall Warhol book. I almost said Waldo. Um, this book is awesome. So basically, um, there's different pages in here, and a lot of the pages are based off of different artists. Um, for example, there's one on Frida Kahlo in here. So... Frida Kahlo is a surrealist artist that we just learned about in sixth grade last week. So she's lying in her bed here, and there's a bunch of different symbols from her artwork in the picture, but Andy Warhol is hidden somewhere in this picture, just like in a Where's Waldo book. So Andy Warhol in this cartoon looks like this. So that's the guy you're looking for. So I'll give this one away for you. Let me see where he is. I'm I'm not I'm having a little trouble finding him. Well, so this shows you how hard it is because I've seen this one before, but I can't find him right now. So I'll be posting these for you guys to see so that you can um do this game on your own and look for Andy Warhol in these pictures because it's a lot of fun. And hopefully then you'll kind of remember what he looks like too. It might stand out to you in your mind more. So all of these pages, he's hidden somewhere on each page. 
And there's a lot of other cool stuff hidden here. It also explains it a little bit more in the back, more about him and more about what the symbols mean. So those are two cool art books that I have that relate to the project that I just wanted to show to you. I hope that you have a great week. I can't wait to see your food drawings and what you come up with. If you have any questions about the slides, just shoot me an email and I'll get back to you right away. Bye.